is what we have done during the past five years in collaboration with Marseille University Hospital. I have nothing to disclose except the fact that I got financed uh, by the University in Lausanne Commission for Academic Affairs for my current and future research projects. So how do we pass from neural activity to fMRI bold response? So neurons, which is number one on this uh, slide, in a brain region are active and metabolic demand at synapse is present. Second, blood flow increases locally to bring glucose and oxygen. Third, increasing ratio of oxygenated to deoxygenated paramagnetic hemoglobin is present. And four, there is an increase in blood oxygenation level dependent response. So how did we actually so how did we actually get there? You have here an example of the pioneering work done by Biswal in 1995 explaining that resting state acquisition depicts brain activity without premeditation or external stimulus and actually Fox illustratively said that the brain is active even in the absence of a task primarily driven by internal dynamics with external events modulating rather than determining the activity of the system. So if we go back to this experiment of Bharat Biswal you can see finger tapping and resting state on the left and respectively right side of the screen and you can see how nicely the motor cortex is illustrated in both. So actually functional MRI of spontaneous activity which is resting state it's nicely depicted here and you can see how rich it is in a seed area of the brain and actually the Intrinsic activity is much more important than the task-based, which is rather the tip of the iceberg. So how do we define functional connectivity? Functional connectivity is the temporal correlation between spatially remote neurophysiological events. And we actually have our data. We construct a design matrix, which finally uh, goes to activation maps and we establish a threshold by statistical hypothesis testing. So now, if we go back to radio surgery, which is the other aspect of my title, and especially movement disorders, are part of functional indication. And you can see that early radio surgery was lesional with high doses. And finally, we had the AVMs, the reappraisal of functional with the MRI imaging and brain metastasis in the modern oncology. D'accord? What about movement disorders? Essential tremor is the most common movement disorder, as you all know, and it's actually extremely handicapping for the patient with major activities of daily living being extremely handicapped such as drinking, writing, or getting dressed. Now, there are many essential tremor pathophysiological theories, of whom the most commonly accepted one is the tremor network, including the primary motor cortex, femtointermediate nucleus, and the dentate nucleus, and the surgical target, most commonly accepted one, Drug-resistant essential tremor can benefit from either the standard deep brain stimulation or alternatively thermocoagulation, radiosurgery or more recently high-focused ultrasound and all these treatments aim at targeting the ventral intermediate nucleus. So radiosurgery is just one of the surgical alternatives it has several limitations, including indirect targeting with no electrophysiological intraoperative confirmation of the target. It has a delayed effect and the inability to predict the MR signature, uh, which goes back to a lack of understanding of radiobiology. And we were actually interested in this aspect at the beginning of my MD-PhD thesis. 
It has also several advantages, including no foreign body, it's minimally invasive and has a progressive radiobiological e effect. The major difference between radiosurgery and deep brain stimulation is that in deep brain stimulation we have the intraoperative electrophysiology with the specific signature of the ventral intermediate nucleus of the thalamus, while in radiosurgery procedures targeting is done exclusively by neuroim. So when we started this work, we didn't have many studies discussing the radiobiology of radiosurgery for tremor. We had only autopsy pieces, both from human bodies or animal models, which were stating that this is precise and lesional. So the question was if the tremor network, the cerebellothalamocortical network, is the right pathophysiological hypothesis. In order to address this issue, we thought of both evaluating changes in gray matter density by voxel based morphometry, but also, more importantly, changes in functional connectivity by resting state functional MRI at the level of different brain networks. Our project included patients with essential tremor treated in Marseille University Hospital by Professor Regis, scanned both at baseline and one year, all benefiting from left unilateral radiosurgery. We had no comparison, and the question was to correlate percentage of improvement in tremor score on the treated hand with changes in structural and functional connectomics. In a first study, we tried to correlate gray matter density changes with percentage of alleviation in tremor score on the treated hand. In this series, 81% were responders and 80% were non responders Astonishingly, longitudinal changes in gray matter density were mainly present in a statistically significant manner in the parahypocampal place area, which is outside the tremor X. And as you can see on the box plots on the upper left side, we could completely separate non-responders presenting with hypertrophy after treatment from responders with slight atrophy after treatment. In another study, pretherapeutic gray matter density, so only pretherapeutic MRI predicted clinical outcome one year after radio surgery, and again. Broadman area 18, which is part of the extra striat cortex, the second major visual area, predicted tremor improvement and actually higher gray matter density in this area was related to a better improvement. With this in mind, let's discuss the resting state functional MRI changes In a first project, we included no hypothesis in the statistical model, and we used independent component analysis, which is actually a method of separation of different networks based on the cocktail party problem, which means that underlying speech signal from multiple sources, for example, in a noisy room, are individual. And by using these models, actually, we could reveal large-scale brain networks which are actually demonstrated to be similar to task-based networks. So, in a first study we published in Acta Neurochirurgica and Further in Brain, uh, we found that interconnectivity between uh, bilateral motor cortex, frontal eye fields, and cerebellum network was interconnected again with parts of the right extra striate cortex. And you could see that based on the tremor score on the treated hand improvement, more or less than 50%, we could completely separate two types of patient's profile. And if we see this more in detail, 
and we summarized this in a letter to the editor to Brain, we had mainly two networks which were statistically significant and both included visual clusters. One included interconnectivity between right visual association area with a network including the cerebellum, frontal eye fields and motor cortex. The second was a salience network which is also known to be disrupted in essential tremor and this network interconnected with right fusiform gyros. And again, we could completely separate two individual profiles of patients improving more or less than 50%. In a second type of study, we actually used the prior hypothesis of the tremor network. So we needed to extract the motor thalamus in the individual patient. We did this with the help of Elena and Idenovska, which actually used individual diffusion data and based on the methodology she already published, she could furnish us the motor thalamus in the individual patient. And this was based on the Morel nomenclature, which is a well-established one. So the next question was whether the MR signature after radiosurgery for tremor, after thalamotomy, would be inside the ventrolateral ventral cluster, which is the motor cluster we segmented from diffusion data. And actually, this was the case in every patient. So we further performed a seed to voxel analysis, meaning we extracted time courses of this particular area. And, for example, we could see that connectivity between this area and uh, the right fusiform gyrus is aberrant as compared to healthy control and is normalizing one year after stereotactic radiosurgery thalamotomy. So this was a quite important and interesting finding, again, related to visual clusters. Also, using both pre- and post-therapeutic data, we showed reorganization of dorsal attention network one year after radiosurgery. And this is extremely important as it is related to visuospatial cueing tasks which are relevant in essential tremor. If we discuss dynamically what's happening before and after the treatment on longitudinal uh, databases, one could see also changes in the decreasing connectivity in the right insular and in orbitofrontal cortex or also in the right posterior parietal and supramarginal gyrus, which are also uh, known to be uh, affected in essential tremor. I think one major step was to see whether we could see how brain rewires himself dynamically during 10 minutes of acquisition. So we actually used an in-house toolbox developed in Geneva by Thomas Bolton and uh, Dimitri van de Ville and we evaluate connectivity activation patterns in this population actually by identifying data frames that correspond to key events during 10 minutes of acquisitions and averaging all selected frames lead to proxy for seed connectivity. So getting into more practical detail, we knew that we had the tremor network as the current paradigm and we actually wanted to see how connectivity activation pattern of the right extra stride cortex would relate in our data. And we finally uh, were able to show three different types of network. One was the cerebellotalamo uh, visuomotor network on the left side. The second was the talamo visuomotor network, which includes actually the targeted thalamus. You have it in the middle of the slide and also a completely different network, which was the basal ganglia and extra stride cortex. So this was on the descriptive side, and we published this in the Journal of Neurosurgery earlier this year. And the question was, how would the data project on these time frames, the clinical data? And you have the number of occurrences, and you can see in each of these connectivity activation patterns individually that they have aberrant uh, functional connectivity values before radiosurgery 
and they all go back to uh, healthy control values or similar after radio surgery. So there is a normalization of uh, aberrant pretherapeutic functional connectivity after radio surgery. So mostly relevant were the connectivity activation pattern number two, which was the Talamo visual motor network, and number three, the basal ganglia and the extra striate cortex one. And so we Related this with standard tremor score, and you can see, for example, for cap number two, Talamo visual motor networks, that this is correlating with activities of daily living. Then, furthermore, another interesting cap, which was cap three, was showing mainly the correlation between the difference in number of occurrences between post-therapeutic and pre-therapeutic and percentage of improvement in tremor score on the treated hand. So actually the brain requires functional connectivity of the extra striate cortex after radio surgery. And the question is whether this data showing a role of the visual cortex in tremor generation and the rest after radio surgery is isolated or can be encountered in other studies. That's an example from a PET study in Marseille, showing mainly that the only relevant and statistically significant cluster related to clinical effect was again part of the extra striate cortex. And actually, in hyperresponders, there were hypometabolism in this area. Again, last year, a task-based fMRI showed a widely spread visually sensitive functional network related to symptoms in essential tremor, showing mainly hyperactivity in right V3 and V5 areas in patients with essential tremor as compared to healthy controls. And more recently, at the end of last year, uh, we had a study from Benito Leon and uh, Elan Luis showing changes in areas controlling movement sequences by using cortical thickness, and the same authors just published a study uh, on graph theory and essential tremor, uh, which is actually not showing much correlation with the clinical data, but it's more purely descriptive. I think we can have several hypotheses. One is that the lesion itself cannot explain the, the clinical effect because it's too small, as Kiro was saying. Uh, the second theory is the Cochair theory by Jean Regis, which says mainly that we have areas of no effect, modulation, subnecrotic and necrotic in and around the target, which could explain distant changes and distant aspects. And the third, which was most appealing for us, was that visual areas are interconnected with the motor ones for sensory guidance of movement. And based on this, we actually propose new potential therapeutic targets for tremor recovery in essential tremor. But we also suggested that resting state functional MRI would be of benefit in functional neurosurgery in general. So in conclusion, a focal VIM lesion produced by radiosurgery is correlated with a distinct functional connectivity pattern, including changes not only within parts of the purely widely known tremor network, but in remote areas, visual, dorsal attention, and salience, and that the presence of visual networks suggests the involvement of the former in sensory guidance of movements. With this, I want to thank Jean Regis for sharing his latest clinical data and for our long-lasting friendship and collaboration. I want to acknowledge all people involved in this project, both in Lausanne, Geneva, and Marseille, and I would like again to thank Dr. Martinez for inviting me to give this talk. And please receive my apologies for not being able to come due to a change in the flight time on the last minute run. And thank you for your attention.